Good morning. Glad to see everybody this morning and just uh, thank you for being here and us uh, being ready to worship together. If you're a guest, thank you for being here. We're always excited to have you and of course we hope you feel at home when you're here. We want to connect with you and just see how we can serve you and how we can pray for you. Uh, there are connect cards on our tables that are out in our foyer or over in the Welcome Center. And so you can fill out one of those cards for us. We really appreciate that. And you can take it over to our Welcome Center after the service this morning. They'll have a gift uh, there waiting for you. So just thank you guys for being here. And uh, for anybody that's watching at home, thank you for joining us too. Uh, we're, we're excited to be able to be together and worship any way we can. So thank you guys for joining us. And I have a, a verse I want to share with you this morning. It's from uh, the book of James. It's chapter 1. It's uh, verse 13. And it says, No one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone himself. What that means to me is God's never going to lead me down the wrong road. He's never going to lead me to a, to a path of temptation. And so we have to understand that we've got a God that loves us so much, he only wants what's best for us every single second of your day. So know that God is going to lead you always in the right direction. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the blessing of your love to us. Thank you for the, the ability you give us, Lord, each day to start fresh. And I pray as we go into this time this morning, Lord, we have uh, just music that we uh, worship you by, that we will be listening, Lord, to the words that you've given Pastor Dave, the message to speak. And God, I pray we take it to heart because we know, Lord, that you want our, uh, the best for us and that you are for our good, Lord. Give us that opportunity to uh, just worship you this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see everybody here. Uh, let us stand as we begin to worship. We wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength the rises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not face you long, no weary, the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need, you lift us up. Good morning. Good morning. 
That's the God. The God you just sang about is the God we come to worship, our everlasting God, the one who supplies us with the strength when we need it, the one who, who does not faint, the one who never grows weary. That's our awesome God, and we're so glad you're here to worship together as a family of God and worship our great God together. So good to see you this morning. I want to share a couple of congratulations for some couples this week that celebrated wedding anniversaries. First off, congratulations to Zach and Brittany McDonald. They celebrated their eighth wedding anniversary on Tuesday, so congratulations. <laughs> Then also congratulations to Paul and Heather DeMeo. Today they're celebrating their 12th wedding anniversary. So we praise the Lord for them and congratulate them as well. And once again, we are thankful for these couples that just uh, week, week after week, it seems like we're just celebrating anniversaries. We just praise God for these couples that are testimonies of, of uh, when you do it God's way, it works. We praise the Lord for that. I want to thank you for praying for Sue DeBlanc. Uh, she um, had that kidney stone removed on Thursday, so we praise the Lord for that. And we, she's been struggling with that for several weeks now and just uh, has really been taking a toll on her body. So just pray for her as she recovers and uh, God restores her strength and brings healing to her body. But she is so appreciative. She and Steve both are so appreciative of all your prayers and just uh, your support and love that you've given them over these past several weeks. And then if you would pray for Lori Dunn, Diane Poole's daughter, she's going to have total knee replacement surgery on Tuesday. So we want to praise, uh, pray for her and just uh, ask that God would bless in that surgery and that uh, everything would go like it's supposed to and pray for her recovery. Some of y'all have had knee replacement surgery. You know the recovery, what it's like. So just pray for that recovery period as well. And I want to thank you for praying for Jessica Jeffrey. This is Mutt and Cindy uh, Jeffrey's daughter-in-law. Um, we told you last Sunday she was in the hospital. She did come home Sunday night. Um, she is doing better, but as we've told you before, she's been diagnosed with a very serious lung disease. She's also been advised that she has an autoimmune disease, and they're trying to figure out which one it is. Uh, they're running tests on that. So continue to pray for her and Josh and the kids and, and the whole family as they figure out what's going on, how to best treat Jessica. Uh, so remember them in your prayers. And as you probably have heard, Vic Roberts uh, went home to be with the Lord. Thursday morning. Uh, Vic lived a long, good life, 95 years, and uh, think about wedding anniversaries. We just celebrated with them back at the end of February, 70 years of marriage for Vic and Delara, and what a testimony and legacy that Vic leaves behind. We're thankful he's healed. We're thankful he's in heaven, but we know he's missed. So continue praying for the family in the days to come. Continue loving on them and ministering to them. We did have the funeral service yesterday, and praise the Lord, someone gave their life to Jesus Christ at the funeral service, so we're thankful for that, that one was saved, but do continue praying for this uh, precious family in the days to come. And then as you know, our community revival starts tonight in Antioch, and uh, it's going to be going from church to church. You've seen the schedule on the, the banner that's in the Welcome Center or the posters that are around the church. Uh, but be praying that God, first off, God would be glorified. That's always been our number one goal years ago when we started these community revivals, that God would be glorified above everything else. But we just also desire to see God do a mighty work in our midst. And so uh, pray for us pastors that are preaching. Pray for those that are leading in music, uh, all the people behind the scenes, you know, the, the fellowship teams, the, the AV crew, the safety ministries that are keeping us safe and everything like that. And so a lot going on. Those that are taking care of the kids as well. And so we just want God to be glorified, but God to move in a mighty way. And so just uh, be praying for that. I hope you'll be able to be there each night. Uh, Pastor Cameron's going to talk more about that at the end of the service, but uh, we just want to lift it up in prayer. So let's pray together this morning. Gracious Father, we are grateful and thankful that you are the everlasting God. You don't change. You don't faint. You don't grow weary. And we come to give you praise this morning to worship you. And Father, we're thankful that in our time of weakness, that you give us the strength we need. And Lord, I can testify that this week. As, as busy as my week's been, I'm thankful that you have strengthened me and given me what I need to do what you've called me to do, Father. And I just give you praise for who you are. And Father, we give you praise for these couples that we can celebrate their wedding anniversaries. We thank you for Zach and Brittany, and, and we also thank you for, for Paul and Heather. And we pray your continued blessing be upon them, Lord. Father, we thank you for being with Sue and all she's been through with this kidney stone for, for weeks now, Father. And just how it has wiped her strength and, and just made her weak. She's been in pain, been nauseous, Father. We thank you that that's now behind her. And we thank you that they were able to remove the stone on Thursday. And we just pray for her healing now, Father. That you would restore her strength. That you would heal her body. And uh, we thank you for just how the church has loved on her and Steve in these past few weeks. Father, we also continue praying for Jessica Jeffries. We're thankful she's home from the hospital. She seems to be doing some better. 
But as you know, she has this very serious lung disease, and they're trying to figure out which autoimmune disease she has. You already know. So I pray you give the doctors wisdom and guidance to figure out what's going on in her body and how to best treat that. We just pray that you give her and Josh and the kids and, and the rest of the family the peace that surpasses all understanding, and you use this to draw them closer to you and to grow their faith. Father, we pray for Lori. She goes in to have knee replacement surgery on Tuesday. We pray that you just will be in the midst of that surgery, that everything will go like it's supposed to. There'll be no complications. There'll be no issues to be concerned about. And we just pray for a good surgery, but also we pray for a good healing and recovery. As she begins physical therapy and begins restoring mobility and strength, that you would bless her body and just uh, strengthen her through this recovery as well. And Father, we thank you for, for Vic Roberts, Father. We thank you for the influence he's had on so many lives uh, here this morning and in this community, Lord. You blessed him with 95 wonderful years and blessed them, him and Delora with 70 years of, of marriage. And we just praise you for that testimony, Lord. And Father, we thank you that you saw fit to, to heal Vic on Thursday morning when you took him home to heaven. We thank you he's a whole lot better off than he was here. And he's with you, and we get to see him again. again. And yes, we grieve, but we grieve as those who have hope, because we know this is not goodbye, this is just I'll see you later. But Lord, we know that he is missed. And so we pray your comfort for Delara, for Jimmy, for Norma, for the rest of the family, that you just continue to minister to them and just let them feel your presence in a special way. Use us just to love on them in the days to come. And Father, we thank you for this one that gave their life to Christ yesterday at the service. And we just pray, praise you for that, and pray they will grow in their faith. And Lord, tonight as we begin our community revival, we just pray that you would move in a mighty way, Father. Father, that, that everything that is done will bring honor and glory to you, but also that you would challenge us through the preaching of your word, through this time of worship together. You would grow us, encourage us, convict us if that's the need. Whatever needs to happen in our lives, Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit would do it tonight. And we just pray that you will be honored and glorified as we respond to what you're leading us to do through this community revival. And Lord, as we continue in this time of worship, may you be honored and glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This world can be so full of heartache. The pain it calls it cuts just like a knife. But the Bible says 
The one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. I serve a Savior. It's what I was made. His grace and love I don't deserve. I will be faithful, humble, and grateful. My life is greater because I serve a Savior. I serve a Savior. Cause I serve a Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sheila. If you serve Jesus Christ, you should be able to sing that right along with her. Our life is greater because we serve a Savior. And we are thankful for our Savior who came and gave his all so we could have everlasting life. And that should challenge us and encourage us to serve him every day with everything that we are. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of James. James chapter 2 is where we're picking up this morning. We are in a series of messages dealing with uh, the book of James. And seeing how it's so practical in everyday life and how as we live by God's word and and the things we're talking about in the book of James, it it makes us more Christ-like. That's what the Father desires for us as as Romans 8, 29 tells us that he desires for us to be conformed to the image of his Son. He wants us as we walk through this journey of life as Christians, as we grow in our faith to become more Christ-like. That's what the, the, the big word for that is sanctification, the process of sanctification, that we are on our journey until we get home to heaven that we are seeking to become more Christ-like. We're seeking to do that as we study God's Word in the book of James is one way we're seeking to do that. And we're picking up in chapter 2, looking at the first 13 verses of chapter 2 this morning. Years ago, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev used to tell uh, of a time in the Soviet Union when there was a rash of petty theft at the factories. People were stealing things from the factories there in the Soviet Union. They were taking them home. And so what they decided to do to stop that is they put guards at these factories. And so at one certain factory there in Leningrad, a guard was stationed there, and the guard knew the workers very well. He knew them by name. He was in that community with them. And so as they came out, he would have conversations with them. And that first evening, one of his friends came out by the name of Petrovich was the last name. And Petrovich came came walking out, and he didn't, you know, come out by himself. He had a big wheelbarrow that he was pushing in front of him. And in that wheelbarrow was this big sack, and, and the guard looked at that sack, and he thought, well, that's strange. That's, I wonder what he has in that sack. I wonder what he's trying to steal and take home. And so he said, Petrovich, what do you got in the sack? I need to see what's in the sack. He said, oh, there's nothing in there but, but sawdust and, and wood shavings. He says, now, I was a born yesterday. I know you've got something in there you shouldn't have. And he thought he was hiding it inside the sawdust. So he made him pour out all the sawdust there in that wheelbarrow, and there was nothing in there but sawdust and wood shavings. So he said, all right, go on home. So Petrovich went on home. And this went on for about a week. Every night, Petrovich would come out with a wheelbarrow in his hands, and he was pushing him with that big old sack of wood shavings. And finally, the guard just got frustrated. He was was curious. He said, i got to know what you're doing. Now, remember, he knew this guy. He knew what he was like. He said, Petrovich, I know you're up to no good. Somehow, you're smuggling something out of this factory. You're stealing something. And I'll tell you what, if you tell me what it is, I'm going to be lenient, and I'll let you go this time. And so he said, well, you're my friend, so I'm going to be honest with you. And Petrovich told me, he said, what I'm stealing is not wood shavings, but I'm stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get so distracted in life, we miss things that are right in front of our face, don't we? You know? And think about this. Every day, people pass us by, and many times we don't even see them. We don't even recognize they're there. Or maybe we see something about them that we don't like, and so therefore we don't want to interact with them. 
Maybe it's their hair color. You know, there's a trend nowadays where people are dyeing their hair all sorts of colors. That's fine if that's your choice, but I'm just going to go with what God gave me. So, y'all are helping, my kids are helping to naturally dye my hair gray. So, uh, you know, so. But some people don't like the hair color that, that people are wearing nowadays. That, that doesn't bother me a bit. But because of hair color, they won't talk to people. Or maybe it's tattoos. You know, maybe you see people that have tattoos and they have a whole sleeve of tattoos down their arm or down their leg or something like that. And so they won't talk to them. Or maybe it's skin color. If someone's a certain skin color, people will, will not ignore them and treat them badly and, and, and not fairly. Or maybe it's their economic status. That maybe they're not as well off as you are. They're a little bit poor. Or it could be their clothing. They have a different style of clothing, or they wear their clothing a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit more baggy than what you wear, or something like that. But there's all sorts of reasons that we can look at somebody, and we can look at these external factors in their life, and we can decide because of those external factors that we're going to treat them differently. When we don't treat them the way that God treats them, we miss out on opportunities that God has given us. When we look at these external factors that are in their life, whatever it may be, and I gave you just a few, and there may be other things, and we decide that, you know what, I'm going to treat them differently we miss out on the opportunities that God has given us by bringing people into our lives that we have a chance to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them and their lives to be changed for all eternity. And so today, we're talking about the topic, as you see, treat others the way God does. That's what he calls us to do. We're going to treat others, everybody, the way God does. And so today, as we look at James chapter 2, we're going to see the need to do that, and, and he's going to tell us how we can go about doing that. So if you're physically able, stand with me in honor of reading God's holy word. And let's look at James chapter 2 and read the first 13 verses there. My brethren, do not hold the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool. That, that, excuse me, have, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? If you really <clears throat> Excuse me, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Father, as we dive into your living, powerful word this morning, take the spotlight of the Holy Spirit, take the spotlight of your word and show us in our life if we are not treating other people the way we should be treating them. If we are showing partiality, if we are showing prejudice, if we are showing discrimination, Father, Convict us, because you have called us to be conformed to the image of your Son. And as we're going to see, Father, we're thankful that you don't show partiality. And we're called to live that way. So, Father, if we're living in a way that doesn't line up with your word, convict us this morning through your spirit, through the preaching of your word. Challenge us and grow us to be more Christ-like, that we get our lives on track where they need to be. And we leave this place being more Christ-like than the way we walked in. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to empower me to preach your word this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. James shares with us three truths that we need to practice in our lives so we can treat others the way that God treats them. When we live this way, we will not miss out on the opportunities that God lays at our feet, that God brings people in our lives to share the gospel with people. We will not miss out on those opportunities that we have to, to minister to people who are in need, to help me maybe meet a physical need so we can meet a spiritual need in their life as well. So let me share with you those three truths this morning as we dive into God's Word. The first truth is this, don't have favorites. If you want to treat other people the way that God does, don't have favorites. I mean, if you have more than one child, now I can talk about my kids. They're not in here this morning. They're coming to the later service, okay? So, but if you have more than one child, y'all know I have three children, so we've had this argument, let's just call it that, in my house. If you have more than one child, you've had this argument. And if you have one child, maybe you've had this argument with your one child. I don't know, that's a little strange you have, but let's just... Let's just have this argument. 
Child A will say that child B is mom and dad's favorite. Anybody ever had that happen in their house? Yes, a lot of us have. And they say that because child B is mom and dad's favorite, they're treated differently. And child A will say, you know what, my mom and dad are harsher on me. They treat me differently. They don't punish you like they punish me. You treat child, child B differently. And child A say, will say that, that child B has shown favoritism. I mean, that's just something that happens among children. Or maybe it's like this. You hear a child, they say, you know what, I'm mom and dad's favorite. And therefore, mom and dad treat me the best. They love me better than they love you. I mean, that happens all the time, doesn't it? You know? But what it comes down to, you know this as well as I do, as parents, we should not treat one child any different than the other child. We should love all of our children the same. We should not have any favorites. But the sad reality is we live in a fallen world, so sometimes there are favorites. But when it comes to life, think about this. We don't always treat others the same, do we? Sometimes we have our favorites in life. Not just talking about our children. I'm talking about the people in general. And therefore, because we have our favorites, they're treated differently. Maybe they're treated a little bit better that this group is our favorites as opposed to that group being not our favorites. So we treat that group better. And if we're going to treat others the way that God does, we can't have favorites. Look again what he says in verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. The word for partiality there is actually a combination of two words in the Greek language. And it means this. first word is face, and the second word is to hold or to grab. So literally it means that to take hold of a person's face. So what James is saying here is that, is that we judge strictly based on what someone is on the outside. We see them on the outside, and we show them partiality because we're judging them according to the outside. I mean, we've all heard the saying, never judge a book by its cover. But how often do we do that in life? We look at somebody... And because of the, their skin color, because of their hair color, because of their clothes, because of this or whatever else it may be, we make a judgment about them. And what James is saying here is that if you truly have faith in Jesus Christ, you're not, you're not going to live this way. We shouldn't be living this way. That we should grow in our faith in such a way that we don't treat others this way. That we don't judge them based on what's on the outside. If you judge people by their first impressions, or if you judge people just basically solely what's on the outside, whether it's their skin color, or how they're dressed, or how they look, or how many piercings they have, or whatever it may be, the vast majority of the time, you're making a misjudgment. Has that ever happened to you? You judge somebody based by what they look like, and you think, oh, that person's crazy, that person doesn't do this, that person doesn't do that right, they do this, or whatever, and when you get to know them, you think, man, I was totally wrong. It happens all the time. It reminds me of a judge I heard about that was in a court, and he was trying to get a jury together. And these prospective jurors, if you ever had the, the joy of serving on a jury, you've been through this. And some of y'all chuckle because you've been there. Um, you know, you're asked all sorts of questions. You're, you're grilled by the attorneys and by the judge. And so, you know, this judge was getting frustrated because every prospective juror would come up and they would give all sorts of excuses of why they could not serve on this jury. And finally, he got to one prospective juror, and the judge said this. He said, look, tell me why you can't serve on this jury. And that man said, your honor, I'm a very biased man. I'm a very prejudiced man. He says, why? Why is that? And so that man stood up. He pointed to some man in the courtroom. He, he was wearing a suit. He said, that, that man right there, I, look one, I took one look at that man, and I'm convinced that man is guilty. And that judge looked at that prospective juror. He said, you're an idiot. That's not the defendant. That's his attorney. <laughs> you know, oftentimes when we judge based on the outside appearance of somebody, we make misjudgments, don't we? And James is addressing the issue of having prejudice against poor people and bias in favor of rich people because, you know, of what he's dealing with here. But you think about his argument here, it applies to any type of prejudice we have, any type of bias we may have. We're not to make decisions about people based on external factors. We need to get to know people. I mean, after all, this is not the way that Jesus lived his life. I mean, if Jesus judged people based on external factors, he never would have hung out with sinners like he did. But Jesus saw sinners who needed a Savior, and so that's where he spent his time. And we need to do the same. Because remember, we're trying to be Christ-like. We're desiring to be Christ-like. Listen to how Moses described God back in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. And look what he says here, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. Moses made it pretty clear. God is not a God who has favorites. God is not a God who shows partiality. God is not a God who's prejudiced or discriminates. I mean, that's pretty clear there. God doesn't show partiality. He doesn't have favorites. Now, someone may say this, well, wait a minute. I think it'd be neat if God had favorites. And we think that we're going to be in God's favorite group, right? 
I mean, think about it. You know, some people might say, if I was in God's favorite group, you know, we dream about what could happen. You know, that, you know he would treat me better than the other, the other people. He would, he would treat other people more harshly than he treats me. He might be more gracious with me than, than he is with other people. And we just assume because of who we are, we think we're going to be one of God's favorites. But let's flip the coin. What if you weren't in God's favorite group and somebody else was? How would you like it then? But aren't you thankful that God doesn't have favorites? That God deals with us all the same. He loves us all the same. He shows us all grace and mercy the same. He doesn't have favorites. It may sound good to think we're going to be one of God's favorites, but, you know, God doesn't have favorites. I'm thankful he treats me the same. Because honestly, I don't deserve the mercy and grace he gives me every day of my life. Paul addresses this issue in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 2, verse 11, he says this, For there is no partiality with God. I mean, that's pretty clear cut right there, isn't it? God has no favorites. If we're striving to live our lives and to bring honor and glory to God, if we're desiring to seek to be more Christ-like, then we need to line up our lives with God's word and God's character and have no favorites in our life. You see, the problem with having favorites is when we have favorites, that means somebody else is neglected. And think about that on a spiritual spectrum there for a moment. Therefore, if, if, if we have favorites, we're not going to love everybody like we should love everybody. If we have favorites, we're not going to share the love of Jesus Christ with others the way we should share the love of Jesus Christ. If we have favorites, we're not going to help meet a need in someone else's life because they may not me be in our favorite group. If we have favorites, we're not going to go to everybody and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're just going to go to the people that we like that are our favorites. But God has called us to to go to everybody and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, if we have favorites, understand the, the ramifications here. If we have favorites, it could mean this. We don't take the gospel to the people like we should. And let's carry that on out. That means people die and go to hell. That's what it means. Do you see the ultimate problem with partiality? Do you see the ultimate problem with having favorites? We need to have a biblical perspective. We need to have an eternal perspective when it comes to this topic. But let's just do some self-examination this morning. Let's look at our own lives. Do we have favorites? Are we treating people with partiality? Are we loving all people like we should? Are we reaching all people like we should? Or are we making judgments based on some type of external fact? Friend, if you're going to treat others the way that God does, then we need to reach and care for all people like we should. That means we cannot have favorites. But here's the second truth that James shares with us. See others as God does. See others as God does. James describes a situation of prejudice and discrimination here that was, that was happening in the early church. And really this that can happen in any church. But look what he says in verse 2. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a, in, a, in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in, in a good place. Or say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So let's just get a grasp on the situation here. The situation deals with discrimination based on affluence here. So get the picture. Somebody drives up to their church in their Lamborghini chariot, okay? They step out with their Gucci sandals. They've got their tailor-made tunic. They've got their Rolex sundial hanging around their neck. And they walk into church, and what do they do? They give them the best seat in the house. Now, if it's a Baptist church, that means you guys in the back row, you got to go because, you know, the Baptist, that's the best seat in the house, you know? That's what they do here. But then someone else comes to church. He walks to church. And his tunic is tattered. His feet are dirty. He hasn't bathed in a week. And what do they do? They make him stand kind of on the outskirts because he's different. Showing partiality, showing discrimination. In a sense, we call that economic prejudice, if you will. It's wrong to judge people based on any of those external factors, whether it's the way they dress, whether they, they have tattoos or don't have tattoos, whether they have earrings or piercings that are not someplace that's, that, that's other than their ears, the color of their skin, where they live, what country they were born in, what their economic status is, all external factors that we make judgments on. If we're not careful, we can make such a big deal about these external factors. We can make such a big deal even about people's ancestries. 
Agent Rogers used to tell a story how one day a lady came up to him, and she was proud. She had done research, and, and this was back before, you know, um, all these ancestry websites you can research stuff on. And she had traced her ancestry, uh, history, and her lineage, and she said, you know, Dr. Rogers, I found that, that my family came over on the Mayflower. He said, well, that's pretty neat. That's pretty awesome. And here's what Dr. Rogers said. He said, you know, I, tra- I can trace my family all the way back. All the way, my family goes all the way back to a crooked farmer and a drunk sailor. And she kind of looked at him and said, what do you mean? She said, yeah. He said, the crooked farmer was Adam, the drunk sailor was Noah. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, we all come from Adam. And ultimately, then we all come from Noah. Because remember, Noah and his family got on the ark and everybody else was wiped out. And therefore, we all need to give our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. We need to see each other the way that God sees us. And God sees us the same way as a sinner who needs a Savior. Not based on our skin color, not based on our clothes, not based on our piercings, not based on tattoos. Not, you fill in the blank, whatever that external factor may be. We are all sinners who need a Savior. James tells us why discrimination in any form is so wrong. Look at verse 4. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? When we judge other people based on some external factor, or you see others through the eyes of some prejudice that we may have, James says what we're doing is evil. Let me just break it down for you. It's sin. It's sinful. It's pretty cut and dry in the Scripture. We can't justify our prejudice. We can't justify our partiality. The Bible is clear. This is evil. This is sinful. And yet it's happening in the lives of Christians and churches all across America this morning. Here's a prime example of what we talked to last week of how we can be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because we'll sit there, oh, oh, amen, we'll do it. But do we live this out in our everyday life? Are we treating others the way that God treats them? Are we seeing others the way that God sees them as a sinner who needs a Savior? Friend, if we're not, we're just hearers of the word and we're not doers of the word. Paul says this in Romans 15, 5 through 7. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may be with one mind and one mouth. Glorify the God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this. Therefore, receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. We are to receive one another. We are to receive others just as Christ received us. I am thankful that Jesus did not have partiality when he received us. Because I don't know if he would receive me. I'll be honest with you. You say, well, how did Jesus receive us? Romans 5, 8 tells us how. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. And then while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners... Jesus Christ died in your place. Jesus Christ died in my place. He died for our sins. This is how Christ has received all of us, no matter what those external factors may be. He died for all. I'm thankful Jesus did not say, well, Dave, you know what? You're not in my favorite group, so I'm not going to receive you into the family of God because he died to receive us all. You know, we know that kids can be cruel at times. You know, there's a big push on bullying and not to bully in school and that sort of thing. And there's supposed to be no bullying in school, but it still happens. Y'all know that. I remember back when I was a young kid in early elementary school. And, you know, I, I, you know, I, I uh, grew up in, a, in Virginia Beach. Y'all know that. And lived in a court. But when I went to school, there was another group of people there that weren't so nice to me. And you know how cruel, kids can be cruel. They can find something to pick on because they want to pick on somebody else and tear down somebody else to make themselves feel better. Now, I know it's going to be hard for you to believe this, but they found something in me to pick on. <laughs> and if you want to laugh, it's okay to laugh. I've dealt with this. They said I had big ears. You know, they did. And they teased me about my big ears. And, and, I, and look, I know, y'all know I love to tease. Y'all know I love to joke. But there's a fine line you don't cross. And they crossed that line way long ago. And they were just cruel and mean. And they even developed a nickname, not to, do, to have fun with, not to tease about, but to be mean with. And if you're my age or older, you, you, you probably can guess a nickname. It comes from a Disney character in a movie, Dumbo. Now, the young people, they're getting the phones out in Dumbo. Let's Google that. And don't you dare hold your phone up and look at me and look at Dumbo, okay? <laughs> so. But that's the nickname they chose me. And, and I, look, it don't bother me anymore because that's not who I am. I'm a child of God today. And that's my identity. 
But they use that, and they, and they you know, use that name because they found some external factor on me that I had no control over. I didn't put my ears on my body. God did. But they use that, and they teased me. Now, it may sound silly, but let me make a point with that. I'm thankful that Jesus didn't look at me and say, hey, Dumbo, I'm not going to receive you into my family because of your ears are too big. You say, that's silly, Dave. It is. But we do that to people all the time, don't we? I'm going to treat you different. I'm going to see you different because of fill in the blank. It drives home the point. I know it sounds silly, but we treat others differently because of some external factor. But I'm thankful that God doesn't see us that way. God sees us as a sinner who needs a Savior. And we are valuable to Him because He created us for a relationship with Him. Listen to me. You don't find your value in what you do. You don't find your value in who you are and where you were born and what family you were born into or how much money you make. You find your value because you're a creation of God. And when you get saved, you have greater value because you are a child of God. You've heard of the Hope Diamond, you know? So, ladies, you're never going to have the Hope Diamond, so don't, don't get your hopes up. But the Hope Diamond is, is considered the most expensive, valuable jewel in the world. It's over 45 carats. And it's estimated between worth 300 to $350 million. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you took that Hope Diamond and you put it in the worst cardboard box you could find, and you couldn't see it, would it still be worth that much money? You better believe it was. It doesn't change the value because you put, put it in a box that's nasty and dingy. The Hope Diamond has value because of what it is. Friend, every human being has a Hope Diamond in them known as a soul. That soul is far more valuable than any diamond this world could ever offer. Because that soul is going to live on forever somewhere. And there's only two places, heaven or hell. If that soul, is that soul less valuable because it's in a different box than your box? Is that soul less valuable because the box looks different or has different features than your features? Absolutely not. That soul is valuable because God is the one who created that soul. Every single person is of equal value in God's eyes. God sees all people as someone created in His image. God sees all people as a lost sinner who needs a Savior. And when we look at people who may be different than us. How do we see them? When you look at people who have external factors that stand out, like my ears stood out evidently, how do we see them? And how do we treat them? We should see people the way that God does. One more truth I want to share with you this morning. Number three, love others as God does. We need to love others as God does. If we're going to treat others as God does, we need to love others as God does. Now, there is only one remedy for partiality, for prejudice. That is the love of God. Look at verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. If you see every person the way God does as your neighbor, and you love your neighbor the way God does, you love your neighbor as, your, as yourself, favoritism, prejudice, partiality is going to go away. It's going to disappear. I don't care what any state government does. I don't care what any federal government does. They can't ever deal with prejudice and partiality and racism and discrimination by a law or by paying money or by this or by that. The only way to deal with it is the love of God. That's the only way to deal with it. James calls this the royal law because it's supreme. And this royal law goes right along with what Jesus declared in John chapter 13, verse 34, when he said this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. When you love others as you love yourself, you're going to look at them as equal to you. When you love others the way that Jesus has loved you, you will treat them the way that God does. And then James writes this to kind of reiterate things in verse 9. But if you show partiality, and in case you didn't get the first time, here it is. You commit what? What's it say there? Sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. Prejudice of any kind, partiality of any kind, is wickedness according to God. See, that's the problem. It's a sin problem. And we're trying to fix a sin problem in our nation, in our world, without a godly solution. And I'm not being Sunday school cliche here, but Jesus is the answer to that problem. He's the answer to any sin problem. 
When we look at those external factors, it's because of sin. We judge external factors because of sin. So to show how, how powerful this is, how the impact he's making, look at verses 10 and 11. He says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So James takes two of the most serious social sins of that time, and, and really, uh, you know, some of our time, although it's becoming more and more acceptable. And in both cases, back then, if you broke either one of these, adultery or murder, you know what that was, that was a, a you know, punishment for? Immediate death. That was a punishment. That, you, you, that was a penalty. And perhaps he chooses this to illustrate the extreme sinfulness of partiality, the extreme sinfulness of, of just showing favoritism. I mean, he could have used any of, of God's law to make the same point. But what he's saying is it only takes breaking one commandment of any of the commandments, of any of the law, to become a transgressor of the law. We're all guilty if we break one. And we have all broken more than one. We are all guilty. But God can change things in our life, can he? God makes us better. God makes us stronger. God makes us greater. Let me just dig a little bit deeper real quick here and give you two theological principles to think about when we're talking about this. It tells us why partiality, it tells us why prejudice should not be a part of a Christian's life, should not be a part of our heart as a Christian. The first principle is this. Think about creation. You know, our founding fathers did a lot for this nation. They weren't perfect, but they did get something right. All men are created equal. All men, women, boys and girls are created equal. In Genesis, you go back and you'll discover that both male and female were created in the image of God. So for the first man, the first woman, to the last man, to the last woman who will ever be born, every human being who's ever come into this world was created in the image of God. All human beings are of equal worth. No one's greater than the other. The only reason we have any worth of all, at all, is because we're created in the image of God. As I said earlier, that's where we get our value from. That's where we get our worth from. So as we think about partiality, if we're all created in the image of God, we're all of equal worth, that kind of wipes out partiality, doesn't it? But here's the second principle. The principle of the crucifixion. Jesus died for all of us. There's no partiality at the foot of the cross. Jesus died for every single person because he loves every single person. He died for everyone equally because he loves everyone equally. And when we understand that God created us equally in his image, and we understand that Jesus was crucified and died for all of us in our place, he took on our sins on Calvary's cross, then we'll start treating people the way that God treats people. We'll start loving people the way that God loves people. We'll start reaching people the way that God reaches people. And when it comes to people who are different, we won't see them as different. It doesn't matter their skin color. It doesn't matter their hair color. It doesn't matter their tattoos or piercings or their clothes or their money or their nationality. Those are people who were created in God's image. And those are people who Jesus died for. And therefore, that's going to help us treat them as God does. That's going to help us love them as God does. So when it comes to people who are different than you, do you truly love them the way God does? Now let's just be honest, it's not always easy to love people because they make it difficult sometimes, don't it? I mean, you may be around somebody at work or maybe someone in your family. Don't look at your spouse. I'm not doing marital counseling today. I don't have time for that. But they're hard to love sometimes. You say, how do I love them, Dave? Ask God to help you love them. And he will begin to soften your heart, and he'll change your heart, and he'll begin doing a change in their life. So you don't see those bad things anymore, but you see them as God does. Someone who's created in, their, in his image. Someone that Jesus died for. And that will help us love them. So do you love them the way that God does? If not today, then maybe today's the day to make it right. Just confess it to God and repent and say, God, I haven't been loving others like I should. Would you forgive me and help me to love others like I should? You know, this is what we're called to do as Christians. We're called to do good works for God, and this is part of our good works. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote this in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God created us and, and saved us, not so we could sit back and do nothing, but so we could do good for him. 
And God has prepared this beforehand. In other words, this is the purpose of our life, that we should walk into them, not just sit back and say, yeah, I see your purpose, God, but I'm just going to hang over here and do my own thing. No, we're supposed to do them. He calls us to do these things. We were created, we were saved for good works. The question is, are we fulfilling our purpose? Part of those good works, that purpose is the way we treat others. Are we treating others the way that God does? Remember, the consequences, the impact affects eternity for people. Because how we treat others determines if we're going to take the gospel to them. So let's just look at our lives one more time as we wrap things up this morning. How are we treating others around us? I'm not talking about people you're close to. I'm not talking about people you like. I'm talking about the people that are different. The people that look different. The people that act different. The people that talk different. The people that, that live in different places. How are we treating them? Are we seeing them as, as God sees them? Are we loving them as God loves them? Friend, if we're not, let's start today. Let's confess. Let's repent. Let's make it right with God. And let's start seeing others and loving others and treating others the way that God does because they were created in His image like we were. And Jesus died for them like He died for us. Maybe that's where you are. Is you just need to start today and just get clean with God. Maybe you need to go to someone and say, I'm sorry, I haven't been treating you fairly. I haven't been treating you right. And ask forgiveness. You say, yeah, well, that's embarrassing. Let me tell you what that can do. That can open their eyes to a change in your life. And they want to know why you had that change. And you know the reason behind that change? You know his name. What is it? Jesus. And it's an opportunity to tell you, to tell that person why you're coming to them and apologizing. Because Jesus has changed you. An opportunity to share the gospel. Are we faithfully sharing the gospel with everyone, no matter what that external factor may be that's different than us? Because if we're not, and we're showing partiality, we're living in sin. Are we faithfully ministering to everyone and sharing the love of Jesus to everyone around us? That's what God has called us to do. Everyone. Doesn't matter where they live, doesn't matter what they look like, doesn't matter how they dress, doesn't matter what they've done to their body, piercings, tattoos, you name it. God calls us to reach everyone. Remember, people's eternity could be on the line. Maybe you're showing partiality because your life has not been changed. You're still living the way you know to live by your sinful nature. You never confess your sins and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, so you've never been changed. Maybe that's where you need to start today. Whether you're sitting in this building or whether you're watching online, is today's a day that you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. Just like that person did at the funeral yesterday. They confessed their sins and they turned away from them and they trust in Jesus Christ as God's son, that he came and he died for you and paid the penalty for your sins and you asked Jesus to come into your life to save you and to be your Savior and Lord. Why not do that today? I'll be glad to talk with you about that as we get ready to sing in just a moment here. I'll be down front. Please, come and talk with me. Maybe you're here today, you've already done that. Praise God. But let's really examine our life today and see if our life is lined up with the Word of God. To see what we talked about last Sunday. Are we going to just be hearers of God's Word? Look, it's no accident that after last Sunday we talked about doers and hearers and, and, and the difference. That the immediate next passage of Scripture that God has in there deals with one of the most controversial topics in the world today. Because we're called to live differently. We're called to be doers of the Word. Can that be said of our lives? And friend, if not, what is it you need to get right in your life today? Father, we are grateful and thankful for your living, powerful word. And Lord, while last week we talked about the importance of being doers of the word, maybe may this week we put it into application. Father, convict us if we're showing partiality, favoritism, prejudice, whatever we, word we may use, it's all the same if we're treating people different because of external factors, and we're not treating them like you treat them, convict us if we're doing that. That we can confess and we can repent and get right with you. Father, help for us to see others as you do. Help for us to love others as you do. And therefore, treat them the way you do. Burden our hearts with those people in our lives. That, yes, they may have different external factors than we do, but they need to hear the gospel just like 
we heard the gospel. So Lord, burden our hearts for them right now in this place. That maybe right there in our pew, maybe, maybe here at the altar, we'll just get on our face before you and beg for their salvation, that you would use us, O oh God, to go to them and share the gospel of Jesus Christ and talk about the love of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for anyone here or anyone watching online that they need Jesus, that today they'll confess their sins and turn away from that lifestyle and turn towards you, Jesus, and ask forgiveness and ask you to come into their life to save them, to be their Savior and Lord. Lord, whatever it is you're leading us to do in this time, may we be obedient to your word, be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and may we leave this place being more Christ-like and being doers of the word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. You respond as the Holy Spirit is leading you this morning. If you are tired of the load of your sin, let Jesus come into your heart. If you desire to begin let Jesus come into your heart just now your doubt is given just now reject him no more just now throw open guests this morning. I just thank you again for being with us and we do want to get to uh, know you better so just please go over to our welcome center with those connect cards and uh, turn them in. There will be somebody waiting there for you after I pray this morning. As Pastor David said, community revival begins tonight so you don't want to miss this time of uh, worship and just uplift and fellowship with our uh, fellow sister churches. Uh, each night there will be a covered dish meal at 6 p.m. except for Wednesday. Uh, the meal will be catered at Bethany on Wednesday. So the service starts each night at 7. So tonight we're going to be at Antioch. Monday night is at Timberlake. Tuesday night we're going to be here. And we'll finish Wednesday night at Bethany. And uh, each night we will be collecting a love offering for Cry Freedom Missions. So be praying about that and what the Lord would have you to give there. Uh, if you did sign up for Tables of Love this Saturday, uh, just remember the doors open at 6. And we're all going to be entering through the double doors over here at the Welcome Center. We are at full capacity, so just thank you guys for doing that. It's, it's going to be a blessing. I do have a waiting list if you haven't signed up and you want to try to come. You come see me. I'll put you on the waiting list in case some things change on that. And uh, we are planning uh, to the Ark Encounter and the, uh, at the Creation Museum as well in Kentucky. Uh, there's an interest meeting for that after both services on March the 26th. So if you're interested in going to that, please come to that meeting. I know there's a sign-up sheet over there with some information as well, but that meeting will be on March 26th after the 11th service. Uh, men, please join us for our next Men of Iron Bible Study on March 27th at 7 p.m. Uh, we hope you'll join us for an encouraging time and challenging time in the Bible study for that. And our community uh, Easter egg hunt and hot dog dinner is going to be on April 1st at 4 p.m. So make plans to join us and invite someone to come with you for that. Also, please bring enough hot dogs and buns, chips, drinks, dessert for your family and any guests that you plan to bring. 
And uh, we are continuing to collect for the Annie Armstrong Eastern Offering for North American Missions. Every penny, as we always talk about, is giving towards going spreading the gospel through North America. Our church goal is $3,300 this year, so we just thank you for praying on what Lord would have you to give to that. And then you can use those specially marked envelopes at the offering boxes. Or you can give online, but be sure to designate for that is for Annie Armstrong Easter Offering. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for the message this morning, Lord. Just thank you for reminding us, God, that uh, you see us all equally. And uh, if we want to reach people for you, Lord, we need, to, we need to be focused on that. Give us an opportunity, Lord, to do that this week. We pray all those things in your name. Amen.